All right. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Um, this is a webinar that we're putting on specifically geared toward the idea of tethered oral tissues or tethered oral tissue restrictions, um, oftentimes referred to lip and tongue tie. Most of the conversation that we'll have today uh, through the lecture and through the webinar, most of that info that we're going to talk about is going to be specifically geared toward tongue tie. And one of the things that we want to address and talk about is it has greater ramifications than just speech issues or latch or breastfeeding concerns. And the reason I share that is because most of what drives people to either get revisions for tongue ties um, or for them to get assessed in our office or for them just to be evaluated with a tie is really that they have had either issues or, or not the greatest amount of success that they thought that they could with breastfeeding. Um, that the mom is experiencing some, experiencing some pain, baby's a little bit gassy, not having a good seal, uh, maybe underweight. And we're going to talk about some of those in just a little bit when I share, share my screen and, and talk about some of those slides. Um, or later on, there's some speech concerns, but there's also some other concerns. And one of, one of, one of which is there sometimes are ties or restrictions that do necessarily absolutely need revision. And we work with some of the greatest, literally, I believe the greatest pediatric dentists in the world at doing revisions. Um, but there are also some times where there's a tie that maybe didn't necessarily need a revision, but it still caused restrictions and had ramifications or issues or concerns or caused struggles later on in life that could be tied back to, um, to some of the ties or some of the fascia restrictions through the vestibular and proprioceptive systems, which is really nerdy. And what I'm going to say, and I'm going to share my screen here in just a second, but what I will say is this is going to be a little bit of a deep dive. This isn't going to be a surface C, oh, there's some restriction, let's cut it, uh, get adjusted a couple times, and high five, and your kid's going to be perfect forever. Now, I wish that were the case, and maybe in some instances it is, but we're going to dive a little bit deep. I'm a nerd, uh, unapologetically. I'm a nerd. If you're watching this, you probably already followed us for a little while and you know that. Um, so I don't want to just give you the surface level answers, nor do I want to give you what might feel or, or be a sales pitch at all. I, I purely want to resource you. I want to give you the information so that you can make the best decisions possible for your family or, the, or, or maybe people that you know that are in the middle of struggle or maybe they're about to have a baby. And these are issues that you might be able to have conversations with them. This is purely just, we want to get to the nuts and bolts as to where the ties come from, um, what's going on with them, what are some of the options you have, and then what are some of the consequences, good and bad, right? We always think of consequences as negative, but what, about, what are some of the good consequences of addressing this? What are some of the results and breakthroughs and transformations that can happen from really fixing a tie or releasing a tie or doing work that helps with the tie versus... What are some of the risks associated with not doing anything? What if you, what if you just decide to wait it out and see what happens? Um, and we'll, we'll address that and I can even share a little bit of our own story with that. So let me, give me just one sec. I'm gonna share the screen here. I'm gonna pull up my slide deck um, and we're gonna get that going in just one sec. Here we go. All right, hopefully you can see that. I'm sure that you probably can. Cute little image here, little baby. I don't know, this is a stock image. I don't know if this little baby really has a tie, but that is a common presentation that you would see with the tie where there is a deviation unilaterally, one side versus another. The tongue doesn't protrude out straight. The other thing that you can see is a bifurcation or where there seems to be almost like a snake tongue where the frenula is so taut and so prominent, it goes all the way to the tip of the tongue to where they stick their tongue out and there's actually like a heart-shaped tongue. So what are we talking about? When we talk about ties, what is it that we're looking at? What are the conversations centered around that? What is it that we're doing? Tethered oral tissue, tethered oral tissues, we call them tots, um, we, call them, we, we call them ties. And what I want to really press home with this is most people know that they affect latch and speech, but they affect far more. And I would go as far as to say, pun intended, I would go as far as to say that latch and speech are at the bottom of the barrel of the things that, that potential tots can influence and affect. Um, 
and in specifically in our neurodevelopment and how our kids grow and are able to be healthy, well, and thrive in life. And so, yes, latch and speech are what drive most people in because that's what seems to be a, a, a pressing issue. It's almost like uh, like a crisis mode or it becomes more critical. Oh, no, my baby's not latching. They're not getting the nutrients they need. Or, no, oh, no, they're not speaking. Their speech is delayed. They're having some issues there. Um, but there are other more subtle things that can have greater ramifications later in life that can be tied to, to to tethered oral tissue. Now, when we talk of tethered oral tissue, one of the things we want to talk about is what is that tissue? That tissue is a tendon, and that tendon is really made up of fascia. Now, tendons generally anchor bone to muscle. And so that fascia is really from head to toe. And I mean that literally. You've probably heard of or know somebody that has, has had plantar fasciitis. That's fascia, it's connective tissue. Think of, hopefully you're not a vegan and this won't offend you too much, but think of a piece of steak. When you pull a piece of steak apart, uh, after you cook it, you pull a piece of steak apart. You know that like white, uh, almost, almost like spider webby fascia connective tissue in there? That's exactly what that is. That's fascia. It binds things together. Now, if it's too tight, it doesn't allow for adequate movement, which is what we're going to talk about. So tethered oral tissue affects far more than just latch and speech. Some of the concerns that we see or some of the complaints that we know of are associated with, um, with tots or ties. And again, specifically, we're talking about the tongue. We're not going to dive too much into the lip tie today. We're going to talk specifically about tongue tie. But in babies, things like colic, reflux, gassiness, excessive gagging and choking, arched back, oral blisters, clicking, shallow latch, biting, low weight gain, failure to thrive, and slow feedings. Now, we literally see this every week. Not only do we see it every week, we see it every day. Not only do we see it every day, we see it a, at least a dozen times every single day. We have a kid that either is currently in the middle of this, um, it, it, or in the, currently in the middle of care for something like this, they're just starting care, or they're on the opposite side of that. They, they're in wellness care now. They've had their breakthroughs. They've, they've gotten their results. They are thriving. And so now their life is ultimately forever been transformed because they've had some benefits with what we've done. So why colic reflux gas? Well, if the latch isn't as solid as it possibly can be, and if they're not able to fully connect as much as, as they can, uh, what ends up happening is air gets into the pipes. If air is in the pipes, it's got to come up or it's got to go down. There's no absorption of air. So they are going to end up getting gassy, possibly even refluxy because if there's a bubble sitting on top of some of the milk that they were able to get, they're going to spit that up. They arch their back. That's actually a couple things. One, it's discomfort from their tummy, but two, it's actually neurologic. Uh, it's actually tied to the spinal gallant reflex. And that is actually uh, kind of how they do the wiggle worm to get out of the birthing canal during labor and delivery. Now, if, as they arch their back, what they're doing is they're contracting and compressing their spine to recruit more proprioception because there's a deficit of movement in their spine because of the tight fascia. Hopefully I can unpack that in a little bit later. Um, but just know that that is often a sign of a tie or um, of a kid that's having, having some proprioceptive issues. Oral blisters, clicking, shallow latch, biting. Why biting? Well, because if they can't get a good solid latch, they're resilient little buggers, right? They are going to get the milk out the best way that they know how, which means if they can't get a good solid latch, and I think you can see me here, but if they can't get a good solid latch that draws the tissue in, what they're going to do is this a whole bunch of times. Why? Because they're just going to try and squirt as much milk in as they can. The other thing is slow feeding. It's frustrating and exhausting. They don't gain weight well, even if they eat for a long period of time, because they're getting negative calories. They're working so stinking hard to try and gain the calories necessary that by the time they gain 100 calories, they've burnt 110. And that negative calorie, those negative 10 calories means weight loss or at least failure to thrive. Okay. Mamas. You mamas out there, which is, I would venture to say, most of who's watching this webinar right now, this is what you're feeling, right? And you're looking at this going, and I can add this, and I can add this, and there's more to it, right? Painful latch, cracked, bleeding nipples, emotionally exhausted, depression, and guilt. One of the things that I enjoy most about the work that we do here is the reconnection that we make. Most mamas come in here and their baby's not latching well, they're depressed, right? Maybe not clinically depressed, maybe not taking meds for it, maybe not talking to a, a psychologist or a psychiatrist about it, but they're just down. 
And part of it is they're exhausted because their baby is on their boob nonstop. And when it's not on the boob, it's fussy because it's not really connected. And all mama really wants is to be able to nurse their baby and their baby to be happy. And so there's this disconnect emotionally where there's a frustration, right? Throw in other hormonal changes postpartum. And so one of what I was saying is one of my favorite things that we see with this um, in the results that we get is this reconnection where these moms are, are literally, they hug us and thank us. And they're like, not only did you give us our baby back, you gave us our relationship back. And like, seriously, can words describe how cool that is? I, I, I'm at a loss. Like, literally, I'm at a loss for words to say how awesome and cool that is, other than to say it's one of my favorite things in practice. The other thing is you start looking at things like mastitis, blocked ducts, um, decrease in milk production, right? Because milk production is often driven by supply and demand. Baby has a good solid latch and is drawn out a lot of milk. Your body knows instinctively um, based on how God made it, I better make more milk, right? If that's not happening and you're not, if baby's not taking a lot of milk and the ducts are starting to get clogged, your innate ability to make that milk or your nervous system really shuts that down. Production goes down because there's just not a need for it and your body's just efficient like that. The other things, right? Um, getting, getting back into shape, whatever shape you were before, whatever shape you want to get into, um, breastfeeding is one of the greatest exercises. It's one of the best ways to one shrink down the uterus because it causes uterine contraction. I'm not talking just like weight loss. It just helps your body get in back into better shape so that it can get ready to have baby number two or baby number 12 or wherever you're at. Right. Um, but it helps you get back into that, into that, uh, shrink back down into that shape or, or help, helps everything really settle back in and stabilize to where the, their, their natural normal state. Um, and then failed feeding often leads to early weaning. Okay. There's lots of discussion and there's lots of conversations as to how long should I feed my baby? I tell people, make it a year, try for a year. Um, that doesn't always work. That didn't necessarily work in our household. Um, but shoot for that. We have people that go far, far beyond that. Right. Um, we say, if you can make it a year, that'd be awesome. Now, the thing is, is do that as much as you can. And if that's your goal, right, I'm not going to tell you nurse your baby for a year because you have to nurse your baby for a year. If you don't want to nurse your baby, it's your baby. It's not mine. And so if you don't feel like breastfeeding for an entire year, I'm not going to guilt you into doing it. But if that's the goal that you want, we're here to help you try and get to that. And one of the things that leads to probably one of the most common causes of early weaning, and by early weaning, I mean earlier than mom or dad would like for that to happen is just not being successful, right? It's just being, it just being difficult. And then you run into the, well, then do you pump and then do you bottle feed and right. I'm, I'm a dad, uh, but I'm a dude. And it's awkward for me to say that it's difficult. I can't even imagine what it's like to have to pump, take time off on your breaks to pump and then bottle feed and do all those things, right? I've seen my wife do it. And I literally looked at that going, there's, I, I couldn't do it. There's no way I could do it. So that's just me being honest. So maybe some of you have to do that. Um, maybe your work schedule requires that. But I also know that we have lots of conversations where the moms are like, I want my baby to have my breast milk, but it just the, the lip nipple connection isn't working very well with us. So bottle it is. Um, so pumping it is. Now, if we can get rid of the pump, if it's not necessary and reconnect, let's do that. What are some of the causes? Now, there's lots of opinions, right? Everybody, um, everybody has an opinion and everybody has a thought. There are lots of different possible causes as to where the tie comes from. And I hope to just keep it as simple as possible. I want to take a really compli complex case, right? You may not know a ton about, or maybe you're experts in this, and I want to narrow it down and say, let's just keep it as simple as possible, but yet not sacrifice details and science. So there's a lot of different types of theories or um, possible reported causes. We know that there's some genetic traits, right? There's familial and genetic characteristics, congenital traits that are associated with it. Um, what has changed or altered this change? And what I mean by that is, it seems like there is a more prevalence or greater prevalence. And there are some studies that I honestly don't really subscribe to because I don't think that they're the most accurate studies that say lip and tongue ties are up 20 to 40% or 20 to 40% of babies are born with a lip and tongue tie. Um, 
I think that that's maybe a little bit excessive to what it is, but I do know that lip and tongue tie is a conversation that I've been in this game 15 years doing the pediatric care. This isn't a conversation we were having 10 years ago, right? I was having it occasionally with people and I've been in this world for a long time, but I mean, this is a daily occurrence, a daily conversation that we're having. So what has altered or caused the change? Ultimately we have, maybe not us, maybe not me and maybe not you, but we as a society, right? As we progress as a society and as we've made some advances in some regards, right? Those advances have had consequences. And some of those consequences are some of the fortified foods, right? Primarily folic acid. We've added folic acid into things like bread, pasta, rice, cereal, and even into prenatal. So let me just pause right there and say, if you're currently pregnant and you're taking a prenatal or if you're postpartum, and you're still taking your prenatal and it has folic acid in it, let me just ask you right now, very politely, please stop taking that. Contact our office and we can get you connected with a better option, but stay away from folic acid. Folate, we'll talk about. Folic acid, stay away from it. It's synthetic. It's unmetabolized folate, which means that it's not a good, not well utilized in our body to really do what it's supposed to. But it has decreased the risk of neural tube defects. Now, I don't want to slam folic acid because it's done some good stuff. Fortifying our foods with full, full, folic acid has quite honestly saved lives, without a doubt. It has done a good job at that. But like I, have, I can always say, and like I've said in this already, there's consequences to our actions. As we start to tweak and change really God's design for how we're supposed to function, the more we intervene with that, the more consequences, the more ripple effect, right? The bigger stone we drop in the pond, the more wake that we leave or the more ripple effect that there is. Um, it does normalize homocysteine levels. Um, elevated homocysteine can cause spontaneous abortion. So here's the thing. Does folic acid and fortified foods with folic acid increase tongue tie? Yeah, but does it save lives and stop and lower the cause of spontaneous abortion? Yeah, um, I don't know where I stand with with that. I mean, I I like one right. I like the spontaneous abortions being decreased and minimized. I like the neural tube defects being decreased in that risk, um, but I also don't like the consequences. But there's kind of some give and take with that, right? Um, how that works is it alters the methylation process and really the expression of the mother you know water gene. If you uh, are in this world at all, I'm sure you've heard of the MTHFR, um, also affectionately referred to as the mother you know water. Um, and that genetic expression in the methylation process is really supposed to um, cleanse our system, detox our system, and, and allow for our system to get rid of um, unnecessary, unmetabolized things like folic acid. Um, and that can also lead to, if the methylation process is altered, that can lead to things like midline defects. Uh, another topic for another day, uh, really, really involved. We're not going to dive too much into that today. But something like TOTS or tethered oral tissue would be something classified as a midline defect. Now, what, what that happens, or what, what happens ultimately with that, and I will, I'll hit on this in a little bit too, but I just want to back up real quick and talk about this. The frenula or the frenulum is the anchor from the tongue to the bottom of the mouth. It's what holds the bottom, it really what holds our tongue and keeps our tongue from going down our throat. Uh, it also helps us with articulation and speech. It also helps us with breastfeeding. It also helps with a whole lot of things, whistling or um licking a lollipop or, right? There's lots of good benefits, some silly, right? But some things that we maybe even take for granted that are really, really important. That is a congenital reminiscence or, or a piece of fascia that should recede and go away generally around six to nine weeks in utero, which means early embryological stages that should be there as part of natural development, but then it should recede and resolve, meaning there should be a recession of it where it goes away to where it's not as prominent, not as taut, and doesn't go all the way to the tip of the tongue. If we all open our mouths and say, oh, and stick our tongue to the roof of our mouth, we can all probably see a frenula, um, which is that connective tissue. All of them will be a little bit different sizes and shapes, 
but they all should receive. That's what they naturally are supposed to do. Now, consequences. Consequences structurally is that kids don't outgrow this. If there's not a revision done, if there's a true tongue tie and there's not a revision and there's not some adequate chiropractic care to help in that process, kids don't outgrow this. It's not something that goes away. The tendon and the fascia, it doesn't stretch over time. It doesn't wear out. It doesn't elongate. It stays taut. And as they continue to grow, that tendon, which doesn't grow with them, becomes more taut and more taut and more taut and can have possibly have greater comp uh, consequences is what I was looking for. There we go. Um, posturally, looking at the younger kids, things like torticollis. What is torticollis? Well, if you look at the image of this baby on the background here, the head tilt a little bit to the side, that's torticollis. Torticollis is a really a, a shortening of the, the lateral aspect of musculature on the side of the neck, which basically means that baby is stuck with their head and lateral flexion. Um, torticollis can also lead to plagiocephaly. Plagiocephaly is a really fancy way of seeing a misshaped head, okay? And there are things um, and, and, and modalities, treatment protocols like helmets that can help reshape the head. And here's, or there are physical therapy and things like that that can help with the torticollis. But if the underlying cause that's driving that is tethered or tissue or tight fascia, then you can wear the helmet and it's going to reshape, but then there's just going to be another consequence, right? You may have addressed that issue, but there's just going to be spillover into some other kind of issue. I talked about arching the back. If the, the fascia is tight, um, there's going to be a natural back, uh, arch back. Side dominance, right? Throw torticollis plagiocephaly and an arch back into the equation of a baby with tots and have them feed or roll, and they're gonna have a side dominance. They're going to be fixated one way or another. So moms come in here all day long to say, my baby feeds really well on the left side, my baby doesn't feed very well on the right side. Could it be that the milk production is different? Yeah, could it just be that they have tension in their neck that simple chiropractic care, and I don't know if there's such thing as simple chiropractic care, but could it just be that standard pediatric chiropractic care can reduce that tension and get them bilaterally equal? Absolutely, we see that all the time, um, all the time. But could it also be that there's a uh, tethered oral tissue? Yeah, and, and really it's oftentimes not necessarily an either or, a lot of times it's a both and. Poor tummy time. Kids with tight fascia, pulling them into flexion, don't like extension because that just means a um, rug burn on their nose because they're not able to fully extend well. They can arch their back, but they're not very good at cervical or neck extension. And so if they're not very good at neck or cervical uh, extension, what ends up happening is they just face plant a whole bunch of times, which then, I mean, who really likes to do that, right? And then missed motor uh, milestones, crawling, walking, tummy time's crucial. It's, it's pivotal. It is probably the most important post revision. There's nothing greater for post revision other than chiropractic first and tummy time second. Um, so missed motor milestones, not crawling on time, not walking, okay? This, that is specifically the kiddos that have a tie that really hasn't been diagnosed or hasn't been addressed. Older kids, slouched for posture. Anybody seen a teenager lately, right? Some of it is they're just on their phone like this, poor posture, right? But what if it is this, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit, what if it's the fascia that's pulling them here, right? Then they get on their, their technology and they're like this even more, which then just makes everything more and more and more tight. Mouth breathing, right? That, that tightness tends to cause this, which tends to cause mouth issue or mouth breathing, which leads to a whole slew of airway issues. I'm really good friends with a couple of dentists in the area. Um, and we, yes, we're nerds. We talk shop even when we're just hanging out as friends. And some of the talk, stuff we talk about is the, the science out lately on just mouth breathing um, and what it does to the tonsils, what it does to gas exchanges, what it can even do to kidney function. Um, mouth breathing is not preferred. Nose breathing is what we want. And if a baby is stuck like this, right, whether sleeping or awake, that has consequences because there are natural defense for infection in the respiratory airway. Our first defense, I shouldn't say just our only defense, but our first defense is our, our nasal passage, right? There's all kinds of things that need to pass or that, that air and nasties, right, need to pass through going through our nose so that they never even reach our tonsils um, or our adenoids 
And so if we're mouth breathing, we're just inviting that stuff straight in there, right in there, right in there. We're not, there's no gateway. There's no security checkpoints like there would be in the nasal passage, which then meets, leads to chronic infection and those types of things. So here we go. Enlarged tonsils, apnea, recurrent infections, headaches, fatigue, neck and back pain, and then malocclusion of bite. Their bite could be off, right? It could be sideways one way or another. It could be an underbite. It can be an overbite. Um, there could just be a lot of different things that are, are, are probably going to warrant, even with the revision, are going to warrant orthodontic work. Chiropractic. How does chiropractic tie into this, right? Pun intended, but how does chiropractic tie into this? Um, well, I'll tell you one thing is it is probably the most pivotal thing in regard to care for kids with tots. I obviously am biased, right? Because I myself, newsflash, am a chiropractor. Um, but if you know us and you know me at all, I don't think that chiropractic is the cure-all for everything. If somebody gets in a car accident and their arm gets chopped off, please do not come to my office. That is not what we do here. That is not what we want. Do I think everybody would benefit from chiropractic? Absolutely. Do I think everybody should have chiropractic care in our office? No, we specialize in kids and pregnancy and, and families as a whole. Um, and so this is the type of thing that we specialize in. And I can say unapologetically that kiddos that get care that have TOTS and get chiropractic care by a expert in pediatric care. Um, side note, don't take this case to standard chiropractic office um, unless they have extensive treatment or, or, or training in this specifically, because this is not like treating uh, an adult with a tight neck. The kids are not a smaller version of an adult. If you're going to take your kids to a chiropractor, take them to a chiropractor that specializes in pediatrics and that sees this stuff all day long. Um, you will absolutely thank me for that. If it's not my office, and I understand people from all over the world are going to watch this webinar. That's what happens every time I release content. We get hits from New Zealand, from Australia, from Germany, from the United States, from Canada, um, from Mexico, all over the place. We get people that watch. And so side note with that, if you want to help or if you need help finding a pediatric chiropractor, contact us anyways. Even if you're far away and you don't want to make the commute from Australia, not that you're going to make a commute from Australia, but if you don't want to relocate your family here for a couple months for care, um, then reach out to us because we might be able to connect you with somebody that can give, get you help, right? Uh, all over the world, we're connected to people that might be able to help with these, these types of things. So chiropractically, biomechanically, tight fascia and muscles, neck and oral fascia are not independent. Do this with me real quick. You're going to make a little bit of a funny face, but I want you to tighten your neck as much as you possibly can and then try and swallow. Um, it doesn't work very well, right? The other thing is it changes the way you talk because it changes the way that everything, all, all of the structures are. And so the neck and oral fascia are not independent. Neurologically and structurally, they actually can't function independently. They have to fire certain things, have to fire at the same time because two different muscles might be innervated or get their information from the same nerve. And when that nerve sends information, both muscles go. Like they both fire, they both, they both contract, right? So head movement with swallowing. Here is um, really the biomechanics behind this tethered oral tissue. And I hope that this illustration doesn't overwhelm you too much, but hopefully it gives you a little bit of information. When there is a tethered oral tissue or when there is a tongue tie specifically, we know that that creates an elevation of the hyoid bone. The hyoid bone, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the hyoid bone is this bone right here. And what that does is that changes the cervical positioning. So what ends up happening is the hyoid elevates and then the head juts forward a little bit. So there's the hyoid bone. That causes a contracture of the superior hyoid muscles, those muscles right there. If you can imagine, those muscles take the back of the head and bring, them clo bring it closer to the hyoid, which means that the head, I'm going to turn to the side here for just a second, but the head goes like that. Okay. When that happens, the shoulders round and the, and the whole, just think of bad posture, right? That's the simplest way of doing it. And it changes all of the cervical dynamics. It causes anterior head carriage. Well, why is that significant? Because anterior head carriage, quite honestly, jacks up our neurology. 
it completely jacks up. We have so many reflexes in our upper cervical spine that are supposed to help us find balance in the horizon, that are supposed to help us really ultimately orient ourselves in space. And when we do this, okay, it changes that. Our brain physiologically, neurophysiologically changes in how it responds to the environment. And it shifts us into more of a fight or flight or stress mode, which is completely crazy because then you start thinking about, well, my kid won't sleep and they're constipated and all of these other things. They're stressed out. Why are they stressed out? Because their brain is not getting the right signals that it should from the body. Why is it not getting the right signals from the, from the body as it should? Because there's mechanical resistance to that. Okay. So that's where all of these things, again, tie, pun intended, all of these things ultimately tie together. So it's not just a latch or a speech issue. This is influencing and affecting neurodevelopment. So sleep regulation, GI regulation, their immune system and their ability to function with their immune system gets suppressed because we know that if proprioception, which is our sense of movement, is suppressed, where all of the spine, specifically the upper cervical, give constant feedback to our brain as to how things are functioning and what's going on in our environment. If that's suppressed, then our brain shifts more into the stress response, which then means our limbic system takes over and our amygdala. Giving you way more neurology. Honestly, I think this is more neurology than I ultimately planned on diving into. You're welcome. I'm sorry. I don't really know where that falls with you. Um, but the amygdala is like our our, our emotion monger. It's the one that is reactive. It's the, if you're stressed out and somebody comes and does something rude to you, you lose it. Really, you probably already lost it and you were just holding it in and you explode. So a focus and attention, meltdowns, uh, uh, inappropriate responses to stimuli. These are things that we're going to talk about that are consequences, be all because restriction here changes our brain chemistry and really changes the way that our brain functions. And when our brain functions differently, that becomes a pattern. That pattern becomes programmed and that program becomes the new norm, which then is a dysfunctional normal. Then the body doesn't self-heal and it doesn't self-regulate the way that it should. So here we go. Uh, here is where anterior head care, that, that arrow is just showing what I illustrated from the side where the chin juts forward. So consequences, neurologically, dysfunction develops into greater issues. The, the neurologic dysfunction, we don't outgrow things. So people, the, the biggest misconception, I think, in Western medicine, especially regarding pediatric care, is that, well, they'll outgrow it. But they don't. That, that's just not even good science. That's not a knock on the medical establishment. I have friends that are medical doctors. I love medical doctors. We work hand in hand with a lot of medical doctors. So I am, I am not in any way an anti-med guy, nor am I a prescription basher or any of those things, right? I think they all have their time in place, um, whether they're utilized or appropriately or in inappropriately, like that's a conversation for a different day. But this isn't a rant against the medical establishment. This is just science. This is just physiology. Physiologically, we grow and develop by hitting specific milestones. We are stepping stones, right? Our, our development is stepping stones. This happens before this happens. And we can just say, you sit up before you crawl, before you crawl, before you stand, you stand before you walk, you walk before you run. Okay. We can, we can strip it down to that basic thing, but then there's also things like the primitive reflexes, like the moral reflexes, the spinal gland, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, all of those types of reflexes, the riding eye reflex, the um, asymmetrical tonic neck reflex, those reflexes serve a specific purpose. And if they're not integrated where they're supposed to be, or they're integrated or, or excuse me, or they stick around longer than they're supposed to when they should have transformed into something else and they're still present, that has a consequence. And so what does normal natural trajectory look like? It means checking the boxes when the boxes are supposed to be checked. You don't, it's not one, two, skip a few, right? And it's not, well, we missed this, so this, and side note with that, kiddos that don't crawl, we know scientifically through research that kiddos don't crawl have a higher incidence rate in struggling in school, right? And so there's often this thought process of, well, man, they must get, they're going to be an athlete one day because they didn't even crawl. They just went straight to running. And we can look at that and go, well, maybe athletically that's kind of cool, but that 
is a pivotal step. So what's the treatment protocol for that a lot of times? Chiropractic care, and guess what? You need to have your kid crawl. I know they're a toddler and it ain't cool to crawl anymore, but mom and dad, congratulations, you can crawl with them because then you can make it a family game and then they'll be engaged to do it. Uh, because they need to go back and hit that milestone and catch up if they can catch up still, but they don't outgrow that stuff. And so neurologically, we develop into stuff. We are really um, the summation of a lot of the development that we've already had. Dysfunction begets dysfunction, meaning dysfunction leads to more dysfunction, which leads to more consequence, leads to more compensation, which leads to which leads to lower adaptability. And so this becomes a pattern and a cycle. And if we continue to do something a specific way, right? Good practice makes good habits, but bad practice makes bad habits, right? And there's no such thing necessarily as perfect practice. It's just a matter of you will do more consistently what you have done more consistently. And if that has been a dysfunctional pattern, that gets hardwired into your neurology. And again, that's just basic neurophysiology. That's just science. That's not a chiropractic thing. That's not a medical thing. That's not a PT thing or an OT thing. It just is what it is. If you, um, if you want to get good at kicking a soccer ball, guess what? You kick a soccer ball, right? They're, they're, that's sports specific training. If you want to get good at handwriting, you do handwriting. You, if you want to get good at cursive, you don't print in all caps right? You hardwire into your system and you practice good function because dysfunction leads to, dysfunction leads to future dysfunction. Dysfunction never turns into normal function on its own. So the vestibular and proprioceptive systems, they integrate our senses and coordinate our responses. So all of our senses, right? You, we know the five main senses, but there's also the proprioceptive and vestibular sensitive and now the interoceptive sense. So we could really say from a functional neurology standpoint, there's eight senses, um, but we'll just keep it really to the five that you know, right? Taste and, and all those. And then the vestibular and the proprioceptive, which help us integrate our sense and coordinate our responses. So our body is constantly perceiving the environment. We're always making sense of what's going on around us, right? So you might be watching this webinar, and you might see my hands pop up every once in a while and you're making sense of that going, what, what, what's he doing with his hands? There might be a kid screaming in the background. Some of you watching this might even be trying to breastfeed your baby who's struggling because they have a restriction and you're wondering like, I, when's he going to get to the point of how he can help me? Um, all of those things, your body's perceiving that. And through a process called lateral inhibition, it's organizing, everything's bottlenecking in the cerebellum so that the cerebellum can then do air traffic control or nerve traffic control and then shoot all the messages up to the centers of the brain so that your body can most, pro most properly respond. Dysfunction in that leads to a lack of coordination and a lack of efficiency. When that dysfunction happens, when the brain is not receiving that input the way that it's supposed to, it triggers an alarm and then we become primitive and we become survivalistic. And what I mean by that is, um, think of, again, think of, your, uh, of a time that you're stressed out and you get in a, into a heated discussion, you don't rationalize. Why don't you rationalize? Because your prefrontal cortex has been shut down. Your prefrontal cortex right here, executive function, critical thinking and rationalization has been shut down. You're functioning out of the amygdala, which we talked about a little bit ago. Your limbic system, your emotional system has triggered. Why is that? Well, because God made us with the ability to survive. And we need to be able to survive. And what that means is when your body feels threatened or you perceive a threat, you don't need to necessarily rationalize that. You need to fight it, freeze, or, or run away from it, or flight, fight or flight mechanism versus the rest and digest, which is the parasympathetics. So then we see things like motor delays, balance and dexterity difficulties, um, acquisition of language and speech, which is kind of a neuro thing, reading and writing struggles, the limbic system, which is tied so closely to the vestibular system, and this is what we talked about, it's the emotional regulation in response to stimuli. So then we see if that's over-engaged, then we start seeing things like emotional instability, inconsistent and inappropriate responses to stimuli, um, simple things, right? Toddlers will be toddlers and kids will be kids, but um, there should, be, there should be an appropriate context, right? Do toddlers like to share generally? No, is their favorite word no? Uh, yes, generally it is their favorite word. But 
it shouldn't be a constant meltdown explosion. So transitions, like moving from one space to the next space, having to leave a certain context, all of those hyper responsiveness uh, issues can be tied to poor control of the vestibular proprioceptive systems, which is a more of a neurologic thing. The beauty of that is that's what chiropractic does. That's chiropractic 101. That's why we can stand on thousands of cases that we've seen in the results um, and wave the flag of like lives transformed, right? Not because of what we've done. I just feel like I'm blessed to be a part of, part of all these transformations. Um, and God made me nerdy enough to study this stuff to where I can go, hey, wait a minute. This isn't just chiropractic. This is just normal human physiology. And this is pushing beyond the symptoms and what's pouring out of these kids and, and really diving in and going, well, why is it there in the first place? Why is it, instead of doing things like suppressing the kids or trying to modify their behavior when they're just losing their brain, right? When they're losing their mind, which then means mom and dad are losing their minds too. I'm a dad, I've been there before. Um, we ask the question, well, why are they losing their minds so easily? Is it their personality? Sometimes, sometimes, but is there something else going on? Could be. So difficulty focusing and staying on task. Again, if your limbic system's engaged, you're, you're not assessing normal stimuli. You're perceiving the environment as a threat, and then therefore you become lack of focus. So maybe you can't, you think of a teenager that can't stay on, on task that might maybe have ADHD, but what about the baby that pulls off all the time? What about the baby that every little sound that they hear, they stop, they stop breastfeeding, right? They, one, their latch isn't very good in the first place, so they're probably already frustrated, and then they're distracted by everything. And we hear that all the time. Is that baby ADHD? Eh, not really my call to make, and I don't really think that that's the case. I think it's a nervous system that's stressed out, and they're just not able to, it's not that they can't focus on one thing, it's that their brain, quite honestly, is trying to focus on everything at the same time because they don't know what's coming next. So what is a tie or a tethered oral tissue and what are some of the causes? Here's what we talked about a little bit before, how there should be that recession. Uh, it's a, con a congenital anomaly where the fascia or tendon, which anchors the tongue of um, which anchor, anchors the tongue to the floor of the mouth and it fails to recede in utero. It then creates an oral facial restriction along with a cascade of other potential concerns, which those concerns that we talked about. So getting to the nuts and bolts, what do you do about it? What's the next step? If you, if you think that your kiddo might have a tie um, or your kid had a tie um, and you, let's say you did a revision, what do you, what are some of the next steps? What is the care, what does the care team look like? And that's exactly why I put care team in there is because I do believe that it takes, uh, it's one of those, it takes a village, right? It teamwork makes the dream work. And if the dream is to have the baby thrive in a situation like this, you need multiple people on, on your team. Um, so revision or release, ideally um, a laser procedure with a pediatric dentist. I know that there's, there's lots of debate, lots of arguments as to um, should you clip, should you laser? Uh, what's the best option? What has the best results? Uh, the research out there, um, coming from kind of a nerdy guy that studies the research, there's lots of studies out there, but the bigger studies are yet to be done. Uh, my experience and what I've seen, laser seems to be the best approach. The recovery just seems to be the fastest. Um, and the need for a re-revision or a re-release uh, seems to be a little bit higher. Babies that have uh, a, a clip, tend to, especially if it's not somebody that specializes in ties, um, but if it's just the, you know, whoever's on call at the hospital or something like that, we tend to see that they don't necessarily even clip, they may not clip enough, they might clip too much, and that the, the reattachment, uh, because that post-care instructions may not have been as good, um, the reattachment rates are a lot higher in, in that. And that's just, again, that's our observation here at Straight Ahead and, and having talked to a ton of different other professionals as well. Um, lactation consultant, you need to have somebody in your corner, right? Lactation consultants are more than cheerleaders. They are geniuses and wizards when it comes to um, all things breastfeeding. We deal with a lot of mamas that come in here that struggle with breastfeeding and I'll be the first to go on, on record to say, I'm not a lactation consultant. I'm not gonna, um, I'm not going to walk you through that process. I'm going to assess your baby and find out where they have some tension in their 
uh, where, where they have tension in their neck, in their spine, and specifically what's going on in their nervous system that's hindering them or holding them back from being able to thrive and develop and grow and, and do all the natural processes that they should be. Um, but I'm not gonna walk through the process of, of consulting or, or helping with um, being a lactation consultant or, or that. We have people, um, some, some pretty rock star people that we work with um, that we definitely want to get you connect with, connected with. Cranial work, I put cranial work question mark in there. <clears throat> Why did I put cranial work question mark in there? Um, personally, I think that the cranial work is um, beneficial I think that your best bet is probably going to a chiropractor that's doing the cranial work um, because the amount of education that they receive is that much more advanced um, than somebody that is just a, a cranial therapist. Um, but it is beneficial. There, there's benefit there. And then chiropractic. Again, I'm biased. I'm a chiropractor. Surprise, surprise. I am going to recommend chiropractic care, um, but I'm not going to recommend chiropractic care just in, as a way of saying come to my office because I'm doing this webinar really to get the word out there in general on chiropractic and its benefit specifically with, um, with ties and revisions and post-revision recovery. And whether you come to me or you go to another specialized or specialist in pediatric care, um, I just want you to go to a specialist in pediatric and family chiropractic care so that you get the best care you possibly can. Because even if there's a tie, there's, there's, we talked about there's consequences to the fascia. Here's the other thing. When there's a revision, there's also consequences to the fascia. There's also a change and it's a drastic rapid change that sometimes neurologically can cause bigger problems. Can it help with the latch? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what we see is, and this is conversations I've had with, with some of the, those leading experts in lactation consultant, uh, cons consultation, and then the pediatric dentist that specialize in doing these laser procedures, conversations that I have with them is across the board, the success rate is just that much higher when chiropractic care is, is a piece of the, is a piece of the equation. Um, and so all things that we do to our body, um, or all this function, whether it be congenital or doing something like a revision or release, it has consequences. And I'm going to talk about that right now. So, like I said, please, 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 if you're going to take your kid, I don't care what you're taking your kid to a chiropractor for, um, please only take them to somebody that specializes in pediatric care because pediatric chiropractic is not the same as standard chiropractic. Little people are little people, meaning little kiddos are little kiddos. They are not small versions of adults. I can't say that enough. They're not small versions of adults. Each, and actually I take it as far as a newborn versus the first couple of months versus a baby that's rolling over versus all of those milestones require very, very specific approaches. There, you can't even compare a two-year-old to a one-year-old because those approaches and the standard and style in which you address those issues is totally different. Um, and real quick, a little caveat in there, it's not cracking, popping, and crunching, right? There's no um, Rice Krispies snap, crackle, pop that's happening, at least not in our office. That's not our approach. That's not our style. I generally just don't even think that's benefit, beneficial for the kid um, and certainly not beneficial for the parents who darn near have a heart attack if that were to happen, right? The approach is really gentle. How gentle? The, the amount of force that we use is barely enough to change the color of our nail bed. Or the other thing that is really popular to say is it's about how the, the pressure that you would test the ripeness of a tomato. How firmly do you squeeze a tomato to see how ripe it is? That's about the amount of pressure. It's not about force. We don't need to beat these kids into submission and, and step on their spines and say, this has to happen and we're gonna move this bone no matter what. Um, some adults are a little bit more stubborn and need a little bit more force. Um, but kiddos, it's location, location, location. It's a matter of finding that, dis that, that dysfunction in the spine and restoring normal function. And if you do too much, if you push too hard, which is why you need to go to a peat specialist, you can cause more damage than good, right? Probably not big term, not big, big style damage, not crazy, scary type, type of damage, because this stuff is super safe. And if you look at the literature, like the risk associated with pediatric chiropractic care, especially by a pediatric specialist in chiropractic care, the risk is minimal compared to the other options out there. Um, there's very, very, very few, few and, and little risks. So um, 
with that said, go to somebody that specializes in this, looking specifically at the biomechanical and neurological changes that we talked about before. Find somebody that can assess the posture of your infant. They can look and see how well are they moving. Do they know what movement patterns should look like at specific ages? Do they know that certain reflexes, neurologically, primitive reflexes should integrate or go away at four, six, eight, 12 months, right? Do they know something as simple as the spinal glottis reflex is supposed to engage the spinal core so that when baby comes through the birthing canal, it twists and turn to be able to get one shoulder out and the other shoulder out. Um, if they're not having a conversation, they're not touching my kid, to be honest with you. So looking at biomechanical and neurological issues uh, associated with this. Now think of taut as a rubber band, okay? I would have you hold a rubber band out, but I'm not that cruel. Um, have a, hold a rubber band out and pull it taut or imagine it just being taut, right? If you were to um, hold it there for a, a long period of time, you can imagine that your arms are gonna get tired and things are gonna fatigue. And there's just gonna be extra strain, which is gonna require more energy and more effort, which is gonna decrease efficiency. Well, that efficiency in these kiddos comes from their nervous system. And so you see how it zaps their efficiency. Now, fast forward a little bit and say, okay, so there's a, there's a tether there, right? There's a tight oral tissue. Let's go ahead and clip it or laser it. It doesn't matter in this illustration, either way, it doesn't matter, clip or laser. We cut that thing. Well, what ends up happening if you're holding a rubber band tight and somebody clips it, what happens? Ouch, right? It rebounds, it recoils. And that's exactly what we call that. We call that a recoil, okay? It's a rebound effect to where when that rubber band snaps or it's released, it then sends a, a force throughout all of your fascia like um, a domino effect or like a ripple. If you drop a rock in a pond, right, on a, on a smooth water day, that ripple could potentially go all the way to the other end of the pond. Or even if it's a small lake, that ripple could go all the way across because it carries with it energy that's being transmitted through that force that was applied. Well, who ties up those loose ends? Chiropractic does, right? I paused there intentionally because I wanted you to think for it for a second instead of me just telling you. Um, yes, another play on words there, but who ties up those loose ends? Who neurologically adjusts the compensations associated with the revision? Chiropractic. So one of the main questions that we get asked all the time is, my kid I think has a uh, revision, when should they get checked? Yes. I mean, now. I mean, yes, now. They should get checked now. Well, what if I'm going to do a revision next week? Well, then bring them now. And what if I already did a revision uh, two weeks ago? Uh, then the answer remains the same. Bring them now. The benefit is of if, if we could outline the most perfect type of um, care plan, so to speak, it would be some care before to help organize and, and, and really um, prepare the neuroanatomy for the procedure, then a revision if a revision is necessary, and then tying up the loose ends afterwards, dealing with that recoil, right? So it's load up the system and really get it prepared for the revision and then post revision care would be specifically geared at um, addressing one, all of the consequences that were developed, right? Remember I said foundationally, neurologically, things build on top of each other. So if there has been a tie for six months before there's a revision done, there's six months of development, even longer than that, because in utero, there's probably another six months. So let's say there's a year of development where these habits and patterns in the nervous system have been developed. Clipping or lasering the frenula and releasing the tie at that point does not undo all of those things. All it does is it releases the mouth so that the baby can latch a little bit better or they can speak a little bit better, which is why we say tying it all together, again, pun intended, bringing it full circle and tying it all back together, tethered oral tissue and ties affect far more than latch and speech. Doing a revision is something that can help with the latch, can help with breastfeeding and can help with speech. Um, We've seen lots of cases that have gotten revisions that needed revisions, but felt like they still only were 75, maybe 80% better. 
they come in from chiropractic care and they feel like they're a hundred percent or even better. Like they feel like they've far exceeded the expectations of what they even hoped for in the first place. And so chiropractic is a pivotal piece to this because nobody else is going to tie up the neurology and reset the vestibular proprioceptive feed from the upper cervical spine that chiropractic, uh, really chiropractic alone and specifically a pediatric chiropractor can do. And so looking also at some of the other cases, things like um, poor coordination, poor balance, lack of tummy time, focus and attention issues. Those are all things that are chiropractic things that, that, that chiropractic doesn't treat those, but those are often symptoms or expressions or overflow of other dysfunctional areas or regions. The, sp the spine is causing tension on the nervous system and that tension on the nervous system is causing us to be stressed out. And that stress is causing chemically chemicals to change in our body like cortisol levels to go up and dopamine levels to go down and serotonin and melatonin levels to go down. So giving your kid melatonin to help them sleep at night is really just jacking up or, or tweaking their hormones, right? The bigger question is, why don't they have enough in the first place? Why aren't they able to sleep and regulate in the first place? Um, does that mean in every instance and in every case I'm anti-melatonin? No, not necessarily. It just means that before we jump on that bandwagon or do that right away, we probably should address the question of why are they chemically off in the first place? And we know that spinal function can influence neurologic function, which drives and controls and coordinates every other process in the body, including our hormonal regulation, our ability to digest, our ability to breathe, our ability to sleep, our ability to live, and ultimately our ability to thrive. So here's what I would ask of you. If you have questions, please reach out to us. We just developed and, and really rebranded our website. We built up a new website uh, and it's got some crazy cool content on it. It is one of, I think, probably the biggest resourced websites in the area. Um, and you can go there and get a ton of content. The other thing that you can do is you can go there and you can um, send us a message. You can reach out to us and send us a message and we'll get back to you. Um, I also do some public speaking. And if that's something that you, if you're part of a group and you want to have me come and do a, a talk or a speech, there's a form on the website that you can talk about that. We have a blog. I mean, just check out the website. Seriously, go, go take a look at it. Um, old school, you can give us a call, right? Um, if you don't want to use your smartphone for the smart part of it and you just want to use the phone part of it, Give us a call, reach out to us, um, talk to, ask for Sabrina, who's our office coordinator, or Alyssa, and um, they can get you connected to what the process looks like for more information. Um, and then mention this webinar. If you reach out to us and you call, mention this webinar, because here's what we want to do. I don't generally give a sales pitch, and I don't generally, we don't, we don't function off of discounts. Our office, quite honestly, is busy enough. Um, and it, at times we have quite a bit of a waiting list for people to get in. Um, but what we do value is your time. And you spent, I don't know how long they've been talking, but you've watched my talking head in this screen um, for a considerable amount of time. And you've taken the time to invest in your kid's future. We want to get back to that. So as a result, mention this and we'll give you 50 bucks off your, in, your initial consultation. Not because, again, not because we want to entice you to come in, but just because we value, we value the fact that you really did invest in learning more information. And then we can pick up this conversation when you come into the office. So thanks so much for your time. Uh, hopefully you found this valuable. I know that it was a little bit nerdy, a little bit more in depth and probably a little bit more detailed than you thought, but I hope that's what you're looking for. My experience is the conversations that I'm having with these, these families, especially these young families and these young mamas is, they, they, don't, they don't want just the milk, so to speak. They want the meat. And what I mean by that is they don't want just the surfacey stuff anymore. They want to be told why. What's going on with this? It's not enough just to address the symptoms anymore. We need to dive in and we really need to push into the idea of where's the dysfunction coming from and how can we restore that function? Because our bodies are made to be healthy. Health is the norm. Sickness, struggle, all that stuff, that's not the norm. Health is the norm. And if that's not happening naturally, if our bodies aren't healing and regulating well, it's our job to find out where's that dysfunction so that we can unlock our kids' potential so that they, they can maximize their health potential, adapt well to their environment, and thrive in all areas of life. All right. Thanks so much for your time. And we'll talk to you soon. Thanks again. Bye.